This is a demonstration of the partially completed sequence of cards, and I'll start by giving an overview of the cards themselves. And note, it's cards plural this time, as a sequencer is made up of two cards stacked together. This is for two reasons. Firstly, this allows the sequencer to get at the full range of connectors that it needs to do its job, but secondly, there will eventually be way more relays than would ever fit on a single card. For the moment though, the sequencer only has relays on the second lower card, shown here on the right. This provides enough functionality for the computer to perform the move 8, set AB and ALU 8 cycle instructions. Taking a closer look at the front of the right hand card, we have the status LEDs. The LEDs fall into two groups. On the left is the finite state machine display, and on the right are the derived sequencer pulses. There's a row of nine red LEDs in the FSM group, which show which state the FSM is currently in, going from the starting state 0 through to state 8. At the last state 8 LED, there is an additional yellow LED above which is lit when the 8 cycle instruction is active, and when lit, this means that the FSM will reset when it hits stage 8. Eventually, the sequencer will be extended to support longer cycle instructions, in which case the FSM will continue past state 8 if the abort 8 LED is not lit. In the sequencer pulses group, there's three green LEDs showing when the C, D and E pulses are individually active. Initially, the sequencer starts in the ready state, state 0. Although that said, following power on, the sequencer doesn't automatically enter this state and needs a reset line setting high momentarily to enter state 0. From here, a rising clock signal, that is going from 0 to 1, moves the sequencer to state 1. At state 1, the FSM produces a pulse that lasts half a clock cycle, marked S1 dash, and one that lasts a full clock cycle, marked S1. A falling clock signal, going from 1 to 0, moves the sequencer onto state 2. Again, there's a half cycle S2 dash and a full cycle S2. And so the pattern repeats. With each clock transition, the sequencer moves forward one state and produces half and full cycle pulses. One thing to note here is that my diagram shows the abort 8 LED lit throughout, but in reality this is only set at state 4. In fact, the abort 8 line is latched on from that point and then dropped again at state 1 ready for the next instruction to set the appropriate abort line. At state 4 we have our first derived sequencer pulse, pulse E. This is active when either S4 or S5 is active, effectively making a pulse that lasts one and a half clock cycles starting at state 4. At state 5 our next two derived pulses are generated pulses C and D. C lasts one clock cycle, whilst D lasts half a cycle. The sequencer LEDs are laid out so that half pulses are on the top row, with full pulses on the bottom row. From here, the sequencer goes through state 6, and then state 7. Later on, further pulses will be derived from the FSM outputs, and particularly, the earlier states will generate pulses that will be used to load the instruction register with the next instruction in memory. Following state 7, if the abort 8 line is set, then the sequence will reset to state 0 and the cycle begins again. Moving further up the card, we have the 8 cycle sequencer relays. At the top left are two clock divider relays, which take the incoming clock signal and divide it by half, so that when the clock is high, the odd lines are active, counting from the left, and when the clock is low, the even lines are active. Below this are the ring counter relays. This is the heart of the finite state machine and uses two relays per state or stage. The leftmost pair operate stage 1, running through to stage 8 on the right. Finally at the top right is the abort 8 relay, which acts as a simple latch and gates the reset signal from stage 8 when required. Visible in the middle here are two long yellow wires going from stages 1 and 2 over to stages 7 and 8. These are temporary wires required to ensure the sequencer can make it onto the later stages. 
This is because each stage depends on the next two stages to keep the cycle going. Later on, stages 9 and 10 will hold stages 7 and 8 together, but for now it's fudged to get everything working in this partially constructed state. Speaking of later on, further up the card are the relay sockets that will be used for implementing the next four stages of the FSM. This will take the sequence for up to 10 and 12 cycle instructions. The pattern is the same as for the 8 cycle FSM below, but for now they're unused. Over to the right are the board interconnects. This allows the required signals to pass between the upper and lower cards. For now, there's two blocks in use. The top right one brings the abort 8 signal in from the upper card. The block below sends the three derived pulses C, D and E off to the upper card. As far as the upper card is concerned, there's not a great deal to see for now. This will eventually handle stages 13 onwards, all the way up to stage 24 in fact, for the 24 cycle go to instruction. For now though, the main feature of the upper card is a line sent up from the lower card, which come in on the interconnect to the top right. Moving to the top of the card, we find the upper card connectors. Going from left to right, we first have the power connector. This is followed by the control and instruction bus. This card doesn't actually require this bus, but other cards in the same family will. As always, I solder on the connector anyway, as it adds support to the card when it's plugged into the backplane. Next up is the operation bus. This carries the current instruction class generated by the decoder card, which is ultimately derived from the active opcode held by the instruction register. There's a touch more temporary wiring here, as I forgot to wire the lower wire wrap pins to the relevant lower socket pins. This hack allows me to test the card for now via the upper socket pin. Finally on the right is the pulse bus, which will carry the timing pulses generated by the sequencer cards. Heading back over to the lower card on the right, we've got the next set of connectors. Going from left to right again, we first have the X control bus. This brings in the clock signal and reset lines to the sequencer. Next up, we have the Y control bus, followed by the Z control bus. Neither of these are required by the sequencer, but again, other cards in the family will need them. In particular, the upcoming control card will need all of these control buses, as it will be operating the control lines in time to the pulses generated by the sequencer, according to the instruction class. As with the upper card, this has a socket soldered in anyway, for stability in the enclosure. For now, there's not too much going on over these cards, but this is only the beginning of the story for the sequencer. And as I implement more and more instructions in the computer, particularly those requiring longer cycles, this card will soon get very busy. With the overview out of the way, I'll now give the sequencer a test as it currently stands. I'll set a test rig up as before for other cards, so that I can test the sequencer in isolation of anything else. I've stacked the upper and lower cards together to make the sequencer module as it will be inserted into the upper left card bay of the computer enclosure. To quickly recap, down at the front are the status LEDs, finite state machine on the left and derived sequencer pulses on the right. Moving around to the right, you can see the board interconnects which transfers signals between the upper and lower cards. Up at the back half of the cards are the connectors, and just to the right is the wiring hack I've had to make to make the abort 8 signal accessible from the back connector as mentioned earlier. Following the ribbon cables out the back of the cards takes us to the testing breadboard. There's quite a bit more wiring this time, although in effect I've just wired some of the dip switch positions to tactile switches to make them easy to operate when testing. To the right of the final dip switch there's a black tactile switch which operates the clock line. To make things a little clearer for this video, I've also attached this to the leftmost element of the bar graph display, such that it will light when the switch is pressed. At the far left, there are two red tactile switches. The left hand one operates the reset line, and the right hand one operates the abort 8 line. The blue wire connecting to the multicoloured ribbon cable, and the white wire to the grey ribbon cable. Following these back to the card, you can see the grey ribbon cable goes straight into the operation bus connector on the top card. The multicoloured ribbon cable splits into four-way headers 
and one of those headers comes into the Control Z bus on the lower card for the reset and clock lines. On a similar but separate multicolour driven cable, one of the four way headers comes into the pulse bus on the upper card to send pulses C, D, and E back to the test board. Following this ribbon cable back to the test board takes us to the bar graph display. In this case, the fifth, sixth, and seventh element, counted from the left, will represent pulses C, D, and E respectively. As usual, following the power leads out of the back of the card via the breadboard takes us to the 12 volt power supply. So now we can finally get onto the testing, and I'll start by switching the power on. But for this card, nothing happens. The reset line must be momentarily set high to place the finite state machine in the waiting state, state zero. You can now see the state zero LED is lit in the FSM display and the sequencer is now ready for use. It's worth noting that as I'm shooting this video from above, I'm using a small mirror to show the LEDs on the lower card. This of course means that the LEDs are appearing flipped vertically with the top row at the bottom and the bottom row at the top. I can now toggle the clock line to move the sequencer through the first few stages. As you can see, each transition of the clock takes the sequencer onto the next state. Now, at state 4, we can see the appropriate state LED is lit and also the first drive pulse LED, pulse E, is also lit. At this point, I'll set the abort 8 line. This then latches the abort 8 relay and lights the yellow LED above state 8. When the control card is constructed, it will use pulse D as a signal that it should output the appropriate abort signal to the sequencer, which will then latch it in as shown here. It's worth noting that I've activated the abort 8 line here at state 4 and not state 5, which is when pulse D will actually be generated. This is so it's a bit easier on my fingers as I need to press the abort 8 button whilst holding down the clock button in a state 5 is a clock high state. With the abort line set now, I can continue toggling the clock line. And there we are back at state 4. Quite a lot happened just then, so here's a bit of a recap. At state 5, all three pulses, C, D and E, are active, and at state 6, pulses C and D are active. From there, we go through state 7 and on to state 8. And this is the, where things get slightly more interesting. Because the abort 8 line is set, as well as the state 8 LED itself being lit, we also see state 0 lit as well. This is because the abort relay is now activating the reset line for us. At the next clock transition, both the state 0 and state 1 LEDs are lit as the sequencer restarts its cycle. Also note that the abort 8 LED has then gone off at that point as the latching relay is reset at state 1. From here on, it's business as usual all the way back to state 4. Running through again, I'll set the abort 8 line and then toggle the clock line back to state 4. So what happens if I don't set the abort 8 line? As you can see, the sequencer ends up getting stuck between state 7 and 8. Later on, this is where the sequencer will continue on to further states, all the way up to state 24 when the sequencer is fully constructed. At state 24, the sequencer will always activate the reset line, so no abort relay is required. To get the sequencer back to normal, I can set the abort 8 line now, which then puts us back to state 8 and state 0 lit, and from there I can cycle the clock line as normal. One oddity that's worth demonstrating is what happens if the reset signal is manually set 
midway through a state cycle. I'll quickly toggle the power and show that now. If done in just the right place, effectively you get two state cycles running together. This leaves a sequencer in an invalid state, and pulses will be generated in the wrong places. The computer itself would never put the sequencer in this state, but anyone operating the control lines manually could, so it's worth watching out for. The only way to clear this invalid state now is to recycle the power. So, for the last time, here's the complete journey through the sequencer in 8-cycle mode. The sequencer is now generating all the pulses I'll need to run the 8-cycle move 8, set AB and ALU instructions. Next up for construction will be the control unit. This will operate the various control lines of the computer according to the active instruction code class in time to the pulses generated by the sequencer. The control unit will also consist of two cards stacked together and will use the same connections used in this sequencer. As always, I'll be posting progress on my blog at relaycomputer.blogspot.co.uk so please do take a look and I'll no doubt put together a new video on here as soon as there's something interesting to show.